outside. All we need is a chair black. <laughs> Hi there. Well, on behalf of uh, Perth and Canoes, Alba and Laku, I'd like to thank you here coming to here to the Royal George Hotel, our old event. And my name's Alan Black. Our guest speakers tonight are Valley Salmond and Eva Comrie. Okay? Yeah, when I'm on my feet, I've got a little speech to make here. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's good to see so many known faces in here tonight. It's good to see a little interest in independence. Uh, most folk in this room probably know why we need to do independence, you know, the cost of living, the energy and uh, taxation. But uh, what we're doing here, I believe myself, you remember the three day week, the uh, minor strike, and interest rates at like 15%. And you think, well, if we go past that, it's all done. But now it's back. And this time, it's your kids that's going to have it. And your grandchildren. And you just wonder, you know, is this going to come round and round and round again? So, uh, yeah, we really need to move things along. <coughs> and, uh, and the Tories, well, they're living in another world, aren't they? Uh, they're not on the same planet. There's going to be a new Prime Minister, apparently, and he's going to get selected by oh, 100,000 people. You know, twice the population of Perth, that's it. They have to say who's going to be your Prime Minister, who's going to sort out everything for your rest of your life. I don't think so. So, anyway, I think we need to mobilise the nation and claim our right back to the, to the country of the people. Uh, sorry, uh, that's what the, that's for the why. Sorry, this is still working. Yeah, that's the why. The uh, what and how and how we get there is hopefully Alec will put us right on that this evening and even help us out with some of these technical questions. Okay, so further ado, we've got Alex Salmon, Eva Comrie, the Bionic Woman. I'm going to pass you on to Eva now for a few words. Bonsoir, les amis. And I'd like to take this opportunity on Bastille Day to say a very big, uh, I suppose, congratulations to our friends in France. I hope they enjoy their National Day. And I hope with all my heart, as I'm sure everybody in this room does, and right across most of Scotland, that it won't be very long before we're celebrating our own National Day as a sovereign, independent country once more. <laughs> In other words, together, my friends, we will cure the democratic deficit. <laughs> and we'll do it with far more than a couple of lines or a couple of sheets of paper. We'll do it by having meetings like this and talking to each other and talking to friends and family and colleagues right across the length and breadth of this great country of ours. Now, it gives me enormous pleasure to be in Perth, and I know that that kind of slips off the tongue quite neatly, but it actually does mean a lot to me to be here. And the reason for that, as some of you might already know, is that I grew up in Perthshire. I have spent a large part of my childhood in Creef, where I lived on a caravan site. And I started school in Creef in, I think, 19... 67 it was a big year and the other night when I was thinking about coming along here and what Pershire meant to me I had to look at a really cherished photo and it's my primary one class so obviously it wasn't quite yesterday um, but I remember the, the day I started school because one of the things that I saw there in Commissioner Street in Creef was this most amazing map of the world it took up almost the whole length of the classroom if I remember correctly and the funny thing at the time that I remember thinking quite clearly was all these countries in the world are all different colours but some were pink and some were blue and some were green and I asked the teacher why this was and she explained well that's the British Empire and that was the Dutch East Indies and this was somewhere else and this was what Belgium owned and this was what the French owned and whatever and whatever and I thought how can a country own another country what's that all about however that was when I was four and a half as time went on, I began to learn a little bit more about these things. And 
was obviously at that age, not the slightest bit interested in politics, but I had a stamp collection. And I had stamps from, again, all over the world, and some of them were for countries that no longer existed, and others were from countries that came back into existence once more, when bigger empires broke down and people were able to regain control of their own lands and their own future and their own destinies. And that's what's so very important about our independence movement. It's about our future. It's not so much anymore about our past, but we have to know our past if we know where we're heading towards. So great things happened to me when I lived in Creef. It was a great thing when I started school and it was a great thing when decimalisation came in because my mum and dad could only do pounds, shilling and pence. They couldn't do pounds and pennies. So they didn't totally compute what it meant to have to double the pocket money from a half crown over in 1971, would it be? Um, and I was also able to argue my corner quite well with a guy in the, the sweet shop that thought that a penny caramel that used to cost 1D was not now allowed to cost 1B, you had to get two for the price of one. So that was decimalisation, followed fairly swiftly thereafter by the, uh, the United Kingdom entering the European Community or the Common Market. And so as I grew up and we left Creef and we went to live down in Clackman and Shire, a county which has a terrible reputation from 2014, as you'll all know, but we're going to fix that next year. In Clackman and Shire, I started secondary school and learned about foreign travel and how we could go to Europe if we wanted. We could go interrailing. And some of us were fortunate enough to be able to go and study in Europe. And some of us learned about the Erasmus scheme. And some of us went off to university. And those that were a bit younger than me were able to go to university at no cost, thanks to this man here. So the rocks will melt in the sun, as you well know, um, for us ever to give up free education in this country. However, those advantages and those gains of travel and trade and education and feeling part of a great big world are things that I think are inherently very important and very precious to many of us in Scotland. We understand our history. We know, for example, that since the days of William Wallace, at least, European connections were so very important because of trade and because of education and because travel was a great thing to broaden the mind and our horizons. And so it's with the greatest and most awful feeling of doom, I think, that all of us here look at the impact of Brexit. Because it's not just about higher prices, difficult though that is, and at times empty supermarket shelves or wicked jokes about the price of lard pack, as if there are so many people in this country nowadays that can even afford to buy lard pack. What Brexit has done is it has laid low the ambitions <coughs> and the abilities and the possibilities for all those that are starting school now that might be five or 10 or 15 year old today who won't have, if we stay where we are, the opportunities that I and others of my generation had. So I want my son and I want his children to have the chances and the dreams and the hopes that I had when I was growing up down the road there in Creef. And what I would like to see is a united movement driving us towards independence sooner rather than later. Because this democratic deficit that we've heard about is something that's a modern day disgrace for a country like ours. There have been, as we all know, multiple mandates. But what needs to happen now is that we need the people of this country to speak loudly and clearly and defiantly and to say to Johnson or his successor, whoever that may be, that the people of Scotland have spoken repeatedly and we will continue to speak because our voice is not now going to be silenced. What you saw yesterday from Kenny McCaskill and Neil Hannafy on behalf of the Alba Party is the beginning of the people of Scotland rising as they have never risen before because it is time to return democracy to Scotland and that means that we will achieve our independence because the children of Scotland and everybody in this country deserve nothing less. Thank you, Eva. And Alex, would you like to say any words now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair, and the friends. Uh, uh, and if I just say the camera, and I'll try not to move about too much because I, I know that upsets you. So I'll do my absolute best. Listen, I'm delighted to be here in Perth, and delighted to be doing a, 
a wee half a, a book meeting. It's been a very auspicious week, I think, in Scottish politics. Uh, but why I like it in Perth is that it was actually a, a meeting during the referendum in, in Perth towards the end of uh, August that uh, I realised that uh, we win with a chance of winning. I mean, I always thought, you know, we could win. If everything went absolutely right back in 2014, but it wasn't really until the end of August, beginning of September, that you started to feel the momentum running for the uh, Yes campaign. Uh, and what happened, I went to a, a meeting in Dundee first. Uh, I uh, was campaigning beside the statue of Desperate Dan. And I saw a crowd of folk, you see, a long line of folk. And I thought, that's very interesting, you know, why are they, there's this long line of folk queuing uh, beside the statue of Desperate Dan? So I went up to the guy at the end of the queue, because I wonder, you know, is it a happy hour or you know, could be there? I said, why are you queuing, you see, in that inquisitive form I've got? And he says, we're queuing to vote. And I said, no, no, it's almost three weeks away before the referendum day. He said, I know that, but I'm queuing to get myself on the register. And all these other folk in this queue, we're all doing exactly the same thing. So I said to him, but why do you have to be in the register? I mean, are you just moved in to the to the city. He says, no, I've been here all my life. I said, well, then how come you're off the register? He says, listen, I've never been off on the register since the poll tax. He said, but this, this is the first time there's been anything worth voting for. And all these folk in this queue have exactly the same opinion. And I have to say, I was getting impressed by this. You know, there's a queue of folk in the, in the sun in Dundee, beside the statue of Desperate Dan, queuing to assert the right to vote. And I was doing the meeting, not in this hotel, the salutation that night in Perth, and I was like, kind of enthused by it. So I said to, I said to the audience, I said, no, I saw something really incredible today in the city of Dundee. I saw something astonishing, almost unbelievable, virtually unique. Somebody shouted out a Tory. I said, no. <laughs> what I saw was a queue of my fellow citizens asserting their democratic right to participate in an election. And it was then that I knew the momentum was with us and indeed might have carried us to success if it hadn't been for uh, the uh, alerting of uh, our, uh, our friends in the, in the British establishment uh, in the last 10 days from being totally complacent about the result. They went into total overdrive if you want my own belief as to what decided the referendum, uh, that it was the vote. Uh, delivered in the last week, the suggestions you could have the easy option, you could have everything you wanted. Brilliantly done, incidentally, by the Daily Record. Indeed, the uh, person who edited the Daily Record now works for the SNP government. <laughs> Obviously had a Damascian conversion to the cause of independence over these last uh, eight years. Uh, but uh, now works for the uh, SNP government. I'm still not puzzled that one right through. But nonetheless, the vow is a masterpiece of, uh, of political propaganda. And it said to people, you can have all the things you want to have without the risk of independence. Now, of course, it was a massive con. Uh, the stuff that was meant to be an offer, what was it, Gordon Brown said, uh, federalism, uh, near... Uh, uh, independence, uh, everything you could possibly want in Scotland would be delivered by the vow and people didn't have to take the step of independence. In the eight years since, uh, we're now on to our, about to have our fourth Conservative Prime Minister. We are in a period of uh, continued austerity, moving into recession, perhaps even economic depression. Uh, and we've got just about everybody in Scotland thinking about next winter and wondering how they're going to heat their home in this energy-rich, energy-overflowing country is being covered in fuel poverty. So the subprint in the vow of September the 14th didn't they mention that sort of stuff. And so what I hear, as I still do, and I was in a debate the other night, and somebody said, oh no, we can't have another vote on independence. You had your vote from back in 2014. As if democracy is a static thing. It's a once and for all vote, and nothing ever happens thereafter. Uh, I think about the dramatic changes 
that have taken place since 2014, and every single one of them uh, for the worst. Not that I don't recognize some points in history. Uh, when Neil and Kenny were intervening, I thought, I thought it was absolutely disgraceful that the rules of the House of Commons were broken yesterday. I think Lindsay Hoyle should be thoroughly ashamed of himself as Speaker of the House of Commons for breaking his own rules. <laughs> I have cause in my uh, 25 years in Westminster uh, uh, to read the rule book. You know? <laughs> it was uh, when you have three or four members, it's an essential protection. Uh, if you know the rules on the other side, doesn't it? <laughs> because it's the one thing you've got. Uh, if you're doing yourself and get sat on and discriminated every single day. And I know the difference between standing order 43 and standing order 44. Um, the Speaker of the House of Commons, and I, what I thought was the most extraordinary outburst that I've just about ever seen. I was trying to remember, you know, would uh, you know, John Burke, <laughs> would he have been shouting and screaming like that? Or Betty, uh, would have been shouting and screaming like that? Or Jack Weller, or all these speakers. But this man, I mean, in the hate which was being conveyed that somebody should have the temerity to raise a point of order <laughs> in the House of Commons. It was quite extraordinary. Now, it's okay, of course, for the Prime Minister to lie through his teeth every time he opens his mouth. That's okay, apparently. But somebody raising a point of order uh, about the Prime Minister rejecting Scotland's claim for democracy is apparently out of order. So I thought it was highly interesting. Many congratulations to Neil and Kenny for uh, having the nerve uh, to go through with the points they're making. I can tell you from personal experience it's not an easy thing to do when you've got a baying mob of 600 odd people, and when I say odd people advising me, it's <laughs> baying and shouting at you and screaming at you, including the chair. It's no easy thing to do, but they did it. And well done. what would happen if it didn't happen just one day, but it happened every day? And you might say, well, I'll if I can't manage that, there's only two of them, there's only so many times they can get suspended. But there's 45 SNP MPs yeah. there. Yeah. And you see, I came back to this thought that back in the day when I was uh, intervening on, uh, in the middle of uh, Nigel Lawson's budget when he had the tax cuts for the rich and the poll tax for Scotland. Uh, and I was getting uh, suspended from the House of Commons. I remember the, the 50 Labour MPs looking sullen, resentful, cheering with the Tories to get me out of the House of Commons. Brian Wilson, John Reid, I remember their faces. And blow me, I was looking yesterday and it seemed to me that the SNP had morphed into the Labour Party of all these years ago. And they better watch out, incidentally. And I'm not saying there's not decent people on the SNP benches. I just Neil Joe Cherry are personal friends of mine, uh, for example. But what happened to the Labour Party in Scotland was the epithet of the feeble 50. And it stuck. 50 Labour MPs from Scotland, led by Donald Dewar, one of the most able politicians that Scotland ever produced, but were powerless because they imprisoned themselves and powerless to stop any aspect of Thatcherism riding over the Scottish people. Because people and political parties build your own prison. And if you think that the job of a nationalist, a nationalist member of parliament from Scotland, is to go down and sit obediently Whatever happens to Scottish democracy, whatever lies are told by the Prime Minister, whatever rejection that's made of legitimate demands, then that's not my idea of why the Labour Party's feeble 50 were replaced by the SNP a generation later. You don't morph into the surroundings of Westminster. You know, in my time at the Westminster, uh, Mike Campbell, so Mike Menzies Campbell used to sit in front of me. And I used to, and don't get me wrong, Mike Campbell was a very able guy, a very able speaker, and uh, 
The House listened to him with great respect whenever he pronounced on foreign affairs. Different when he became leader of the Liberal Party instead, and then they shouted him down. <laughs> but nonetheless, when he pronounced on foreign affairs, everybody listened to respect. When men lounge back in the leather bench, I had great problems. Working out where the leather then stopped and mine began. <laughs> and it's getting a bit like that for some of the SNP contingent in Westminster. It's difficult to say where the bench stops and they start. Because the job of a nationalist member of parliament at Westminster is not to settle down, but to settle up for Scotland. That's the job of uh, Nationalist MPs at Westminster. Incidentally, I'm happy to Westminster now. Uh, and uh, well, let's talk about, I was going to say something really probable. I was going to say that something like John Nicholson might <laughs> challenge the chair. But let's just take the improbable. Let's just say that John mobilised himself and whatever else he does to say, I really want to challenge the chair to accept Scotland's democratic rights. Then I'd be with him regardless. Because it would be my job to have solidarity with somebody who was expressing the same opinion as I was. I mean, I used to have solidarity with Dennis Skinner and Dennis Canavan. <laughs> and that was because we all recognised in each other that we were there to as far as we possibly could defend our constituents and upset whatever apple cut we could. That's what you would do, that would be your instinctive thing to do. Not to earn brownie points from the Westminster establishment who will bat you in the head and then spit you out as if spat out generations of once radical members of parliament. So my belief is if we want to advance the cause of Scottish independence, then we should fight a pincer movement. A pincer movement of parliamentary intervention at Westminster doesn't have to be in Davidian Pie and Prime Minister's questions. The Westminster rule book has changed a bit since the days of Charles Stuart Parnell, but there's still plenty of opportunities in which to seize the agenda of the House of Commons and say, look, until you recognise Scotland's legitimate democratic demand to have a Section 30 and another referendum, then we're never going to be out of your hair. Every single day is going to be dominated by this topic, whether you like it or not. And faced with that, you might call it speaking truth to power, you'd find that was a substantial lever helping our cause. But it has to be matched and married by a popular demonstration in Scotland. So Scotland isn't unique, but it's rare in all of the countries in the world who have sought their independence that it's been done through a peaceful, constitutional, political process. And all this will be, because that's the nature of who we are. But that doesn't mean We've got to take politeness to the nth degree and accept any humiliation that Westminster cho chooses to de deal out. Now, I've just got the impression in the meetings I'm doing around the country at the present moment uh, that uh, after uh, some years of, uh, of uh, lackadaisical responses, there's some fire in the bellies of folk in Scotland that's coming back. I've only seen it a few times in my life. I, I saw it in the last uh, weeks of the referendum campaign. Before that, I saw it in the, in the poll tax campaign way back in 1990. I saw it when the constitutional issue comes matched and merged with key political and economic issues in Scotland. And when you see that happening, you know that things are on the move. Now, the firing gun has been started. It's been fired. We have to work forward to the 18th of October, 19th of October next year. That's when there's going to be another referendum. That's what the First Minister has said. And as far as Alep is concerned, we are working to that timetable and on that agenda. It does seem to me that if we're going to achieve that timetable, uh, then we're going to have to examine how we're going to make the other side agree to it. 
If it's really a question of writing a letter to Boris Johnson and writing a letter to his successor, and when the reply comes back, we go, oh my goodness, they haven't agreed, then I don't think we're going to get very far. Nor do I think, and I have to be perfectly honest here, they're going to the Middlesex Guild Hall, where it's where the appointed bench of the United Kingdom Supreme Court sits, and saying, will you make our referendum legal? <laughs> I did describe it as a Hail Mary pass. Uh, I don't think it's a, a Hail Mary pass at all. I mean, a Hail Mary pass has some chance of success. Does everybody really believe that the United Kingdom, and I stress the United Kingdom, Supreme Court, is going to rule in favour of the sovereignty of the people as opposed to the sovereignty of the Westminster Parliament. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, which would tell you that was likely to be the case. And if all that fails, uh, then we're, uh, uh, we're going to have a plebiscite uh, election. And all I would say is, if we're going to have a plebiscite election, then you've got to make sure it is different from every other election in Scotland. Because if it's the same party political election and doesn't have any aspect of difference, you'll get the same party political result and it won't be recognised as anything other than a party political election. So let's take them in turn. I don't think we should take no for an answer from Boris Johnson or whichever one of the hateful eight manages to get uh, success uh, in this Tory uh, a election context. I mean, if Rishi Sunak, for example, I mean, I know that Boris Johnson is no very popular, this is against a bad record and all the rest of it, but compared to Rishi Sunak, he's a bleeding heart liberal in terms of economic policy. I mean, this guy, this guy and, uh, it would send you to an early grave and then uh, re examine your legacy to see if there's anything else he could tax. Uh, you know, this guy thinks that the, the, the key questions that uh, facing the country, you're not where you're going to get the money to heat your, heat your home, uh, but uh, what, she, what, you can, uh, what you can do in terms of, uh, of uh, re reducing the UK debt exposure at the present moment. There is nothing, absolutely nothing in the UK Treasury that's not dry as dust with Rishi Sunak uh, in charge. Uh, so I'm not particularly worried, as some people are, uh, that the after you know, Boris Johnson and the Tory party are going to have a fundamental change of character. Uh, the Tory character is stamped. Uh, and whoever succeeds uh, is going to have that same ethos, an ethos rejected in Scotland time after time. But if we want to change their minds, then we have to campaign for it. In Parliament and outside Parliament. Uh, you've seen what the RP MPs are prepared to do. We should follow and sustain their lead. Uh, I'd like you all to mark the 18th of September in your diaries as a, a major demonstration that we'll be <coughs> contributing to in Scotland, not just looking back to 2014, but looking forward to the mobilisation uh, to come. Secondly, if we go, and I say I don't give much uh, hope for the UK Supreme Court, I think if you're going down a legal route, it would be helpful to have your senior law officer having confidence in your own case. Incidentally, I mean, I, I'm not going to be as far as I know as an excellent lawyer and all the rest of it, but if I was appointed somebody as I did Lord Advocate, it would be actually the first question I asked him before I appointed them. How do you stand in Scottish sovereignty and uh, if it comes to putting legislation through the Scottish Parliament? Because you've got an infinitely better chance in the courts if you put through the legislation democratically in the Scots Parliament and they then come for you, there's a much better chance uh, of winning than going to the UK uh, Supreme Court. But if it came to a plebiscite election, then the only way that could be more influential than previous elections and successful and have any hope of getting the self-imposed target of a majority, not of seats, but of votes, uh, would be to fight it as a, a Scotland United election. It has to be different. So you'd have candidates standing as uh, SMB Scotland United, which would be the vast majority of seats, or Green Party Scotland United, or Alpha Scotland United, because it would have to be a common front if the election was to be regarded as anything more than just the normal party political argument about Westminster election. And you would have to fight it with new tactics. You'd have to tell people what you're going to do when Westminster says no. 
And that has to be a bit more than getting two questions every Wednesday and saying to whoever's the Tory Prime Minister, I don't agree with you. With the greatest respect, I mean, you know, I don't actually think that Ian Blackford would rival Lloyd George or, I mean, in terms of rhetoric. But it wouldn't matter if he did. Ian could be the most eloquent person on God's earth. And it wouldn't make any difference. There has to be more of a political threat and urgency in action than dutifully asking your two questions every Wednesday. You'd have to consider how you present the uh, legitimacy of a parliamentary mandate and not necessarily at Westminster or elsewhere. It has been on the chair, the party chair, Rob Brogan, article last week in the National, looking at the 1918 election. And you look at two aspects in particular, what might be lessons for Scotland a century later. One, of course, is the Irish example of abstentionism, where the Irish Parliamentary Party, which had ruled the roost in Ireland for 60 years since the great Parnell founded it, and then in one single election was swept aside by Sinn Féin because people said that route is done, abstentionism is the way forward, set up our own show in the toilet. Now, you don't have to run an abstentionist campaign, but you have to say, look, this election, if it's a plebiscite election, is for the legitimacy of Scotland. We'd have the great advantage of having a Scottish Parliament in place, as well as the mandate of Westminster <coughs> MPs. But one thing's for sure, you're not going to mobilise the people by saying, after we win a plebiscite election, we're going to get the bus, train, plane, down to Westminster, and typically turn up our press and do that just as we've done 